Hello everyone and welcome back to The Games Must Go On, a series where reading the instructions is generally seen as a bad idea. Today we're taking another look at the Pikmin franchise, specifically Pikmin 2, to ask the question, can you beat the game without the whistle? So without further ado, let's go. Just like in Pikmin 1, we're banning the B button to call our Pikmin, the C button to disband our Pikmin, and the down on the D-pad in order to control our Pikmin. The only exception to this is during the cutscenes, where, obviously, we don't have full control over Olimar. But the rules stated, let's get right into the run. We start off the run in the Valley of Repose immediately with a problem. You see, we're in a tutorial state, and we have to whistle some Pikmin that are directly in front of us. So, is this the end of a run so soon? Heh, <laughs> not quite. But first I need to explain what these Pikmin are. But to do that, it's time to head back to our state chart. If you haven't seen Pikmin 1 without the whistle, I'd recommend checking that out first, because I explained a lot of the basics there. However, Pikmin 2's state chart is a lot more complex. But we're going to be taking it one step at a time. First of all, our wild Pikmin or as I'm going to be calling them Beta Pikmin. Beta Pikmin are just like regular Pikmin except for a few key differences. For one, they can't be harmed, but on the other hand, they can't do any damage to anything else. So it's definitely a double-edged sword. Another minor difference is the fact that they won't ever transition from a faded Pikmin to a working Pikmin, no matter how close a job actually is, and that will come quite in handy. But, how does this relate to these wild Pikmin that we see right here? Well, that's simple. Because they can't become working, that means we just have to make one working Pikmin faded, and bam, we got ourselves a solution. The only problem is, this will never happen because the Bull Borb is invincible to all of our attacks, and the Pikmin can't do any damage, meaning they're going to be working on it forever. Or at least they would if it wasn't for a very convenient ledge. You see, a Pikmin will automatically become faded if its job is too far away. Now normally this doesn't happen with a Bull Borb because the Bull Borb is right there and it's easily able to see it. But with this ledge, we could theoretically get a Pikmin on top of it, which would be too far away for the Pikmin to see the Bull Borb. But getting the Bull Borb over there is another story because we can't push Bull Borbs, can we? Well, it turns out that we can. Just really not efficiently. I mean, look at this. It took me 30 minutes of solid pushing it, but eventually I got the Dwarf Bulborb to the ledge, allowing a singular red Pikmin to jump up, giving us our first Pikmin of the run, and finally allowing us to begin. So without further ado, it's time to actually begin the Pikmin 2 No Whistle Run. With our first Pikmin in hand, we can kill the Dwarf Bulborb and move on with the tutorial, going through days 1 and 2, collecting the Spherical Atlas, meaning we get to move on to the Awakening Wood without any real problems. Also, quick note, I'm not going to be calling out every single treasure, because that would take a really long time. But let's move on to the Awakening Wood. Even on our first day here, we see a couple of things. For one, we get our first can of Spicy Spray, something that we can use on our Pikmin to make them temporarily stronger and faster, as well as we hop into our second cave, that being the Hole of Beasts. And just like our first cave, the Emergence Cave, it's relatively easy, but something interesting happened when I hopped in. That being, we found a way to rescue these out-of-bounds Pikmin. You see, normally when we throw a Pikmin up onto a wall, the only way we can get it down is to whistle it. And because we can't do that, these Pikmin are essentially out of bounds or softlocked, and will die at sunset. However, caves actually offer a solution. That's because whenever you enter a cave, all of your active Pikmin follow you. However, all other Pikmin will actually run right back to the Onion, saving their own lives meaning we actually have a way to save all of our Pikmin at the end of a day. But with that, let's hop right into the Hole of Beasts. Now like I said before, the cave is relatively easy. There's not that much to talk about. That is except for the Empress Bullblacks, the boss of his cave. That's because this boss is terrifying. It has an absolute ton of health, and when it shakes off your Pikmin, it'll go ahead and roll right over them, crushing 
all of your Pikmin to death. So it's not that great of a boss. But with enough power, we can actually kill it before it kills too many of our Pikmin, giving ourselves the treasure gauge. Near the end of the day, I decided to hop into the White Flower Garden, which you'll never guess has white flowers. These candy pop buds actually transform your Pikmin into white Pikmin, so I should probably mention the two new types that we get in the game, that being our purples and whites. To start off with our purples, they are 10 times as strong, being able to lift objects with 10 times the strength, as well as they'll do critical damage on enemies and bosses when thrown. This typically makes them a go-to option when dealing with bosses, but it comes with a catch. Remember, we get these guys directly from Candy Pop Buds. There's no way other than Candy Pop Buds to get them. This means we have a limited supply of them unless we want to grind. So, I decided to avoid using these guys in almost any scenario. White Pikmin are also relatively good because they're extra fast, can deal poison damage, survive poison, and even find buried treasure. However, just like purples, they can only be gotten with candy pop buds, so we're not going to waste them. Now back to the White Flower Garden, it's again relatively easy. Even a boss here, which is the Burrowing Snagrit from Pikmin 1, is relatively easy, so we can finish off Day 3 with two more caves under our belt, as well as White Pikmin. Our only goal on Day 4 is to get the second half of the globe in order to unlock the Perplexing Pool. And with purples and whites, this is no real problem. So, Day 4 goes by pretty quickly. Our first day here in the Perplexing Pool is actually pretty important. That's because we killed all the enemies leading up to Yellow Pikmin, as well as we got our hands on Bitter Spray, which will easily turn the tide in many battles. That's because, when you use it on an enemy, it'll actually stun it in place for a few seconds, leading to a high advantage for us. However, this isn't a automatic win, because whenever you use the Bitter Spray, when it wears off, all of your Pikmin will fall right to the ground, leaving them vulnerable. So, it's not like we can just chain Bitter Sprays indefinitely for an instant win. Now I did mention that we killed all the enemies leading up to Yellow Pikmin, so that means we must have unlocked Yellow Pikmin, right? Well, not quite. Here's the problem. These Yellow Pikmin are all on this tree. Now normally you could just whistle them down, but you can see the problem. Now, we're going to have to take a step back and look at this for a few days. And by a few, I mean 25 you see, in the perplexing pool, over the first 30 days, more and more stuff begins to appear. Until eventually on day 31, a beady longlegs and a bull bear will appear. Now why is this important? Well, you see, a bull bear has a huge hitbox, and when you punch it, it gets even larger. And by positioning it directly underneath the yellow Pikmin on the lowest branch, it gets large enough to actually bump the yellow Pikmin and to actually bump it off. Which means, now we just have to kill the bull bear, and we have ourselves a faded yellow Pikmin waiting to be collected. With our one yellow in hand, we can begin growing our Pikmin population, and even on the next day, we can start going for blue Pikmin. But of course, these guys are attacking some Wogpuls, which can't be killed because these blue Pikmin are beta. But if I've learned anything from Pokemon, it's the fact that water types are weak against fighting types or something along those lines. And oh boy, is Olimar a fighting type. With two fists of his own, he can actually kill the enemy, releasing these water Pikmin to freedom, and giving us our last type of Pikmin for the run, these blues. The next thing that I wanted to tackle was the Bull Black's Kingdom, because I thought it was going to be a relatively easy cave. But I could not have been more wrong. To put it simply, I entered the cave of 100 Pikmin and left with 18. Yeah, this one was going to be difficult, and it was for multiple reasons. For one, there's just a whole lot of enemies. I mean, look at how many Bulborbs are here. For two, the level drops a whole bunch of stuff on you, including things like bomb rocks and Wally logs. So, that doesn't really help. And for three, it has a whole lot of hazards. And if you remember from Pikmin 1, 
Once a Pikmin is on fire or drowning, there's no way we can save it in this challenge. And all of these factors combined, and with a little help from the Emperor Bullblax as the boss of this level, this cave killed a lot. But at the end, we were able to beat it, so we are able to move on. The next day, I decided to do a little bit of grinding before heading to the Citadel of Spiders. However, I almost didn't have enough time, but I just barely made it. Now for the cave itself, it's a complete joke. There's not really much to say here, even the boss, the BD Longlegs, is a piece of cake. But switching over from a piece of cake to an entire cake walk, we go to Glutton's Kitchen, which is, well, a cake walk. There's nothing really here to talk about, even the loaf bug is a complete breeze. The next cave that we're taking down is not going to be as easy though, that being the Snagger Hole. What's so bad about the Snagger Hole? You're probably assuming the Snaggerts. But that's where you'd be wrong as there's a different enemy that takes the prize, that being the Antenna Beetle. What's an Antenna Beetle? Well, it has one more whistle than we do and it likes to call your Pikmin away from you which wouldn't be that much of a problem, except for the fact when you kill it, your Pikmin enter a fear state, which is where I should probably mention fear states. In Pikmin 2, there are three different fear states, all having similar results, but having very different consequences. The first one being by mites. Whenever you open up an egg, you have a chance of spawning mites, which will scare your Pikmin, making them run all over the place for a few seconds before they calm down and head back into your party. And while you can call them with the whistle, this isn't required as they'll return automatically. The second type of fear state is caused by antenna beetles, as when you kill them, your Pikmin will run around, but instead of calming down, these guys are stuck in this state permanently or until you use the whistle. Now, these are separate from Bulbman because once you enter the next sublevel of a cave, they will actually follow you. And that brings me to Bulbman, which when you kill a Bulbman mother, the Bulbman children will run around and they will not follow you into the next cave and will never calm down, which means no, we're never getting Bulbman in this run. But that's basically the fear states and that's what makes these antenna beetles so annoying. Because while on sub-level 5, these Pikmin that get scared have plenty of room to run around and really don't have a chance of dying, this changes on sub-level 6. Sub-level 6 is much more hazardous than sub-level 5, and that's because of a few things. For one, Snagrits, there's a bunch of them, as well as a bunch of water hazards which the Pikmin would be happy to run directly into. But... This brings us to our way we're going to be fighting these guys the rest of the run. And that's with our newest type of Pikmin, also known as Olimar himself, because once again, Olimar can fight. Just not well. But with enough punching, the antenna beetle will go down. Just make sure you stand back when it lifts off to not take that much damage. But hey, at least we have a way to take these guys down. One thing I would like to mention is the developers actually included a way to save Pikmin from drowning in this game without the whistle, and that's with Blue Pikmin, which came in handy here. You see, if a Pikmin is drowning and you throw in a Blue Pikmin after it, the Blue Pikmin will actually throw the drowning Pikmin up onto land, saving its life. So, that will come in handy. But with that, we can take down the boss of this dungeon, the Pileated Snagrit, and move on. With Fat Cave out of the way, I decided to take a quick break and grab some overworld treasures, the only real interesting one being this onion replica. That's because you have to use white Pikmin to dig it up, and then blue Pikmin to carry it through the water. Now, as you know, white Pikmin will drown in water, but can be saved with blue Pikmin, and that's exactly what I tried to do, but the blue Pikmin decided to throw the white Pikmin a little bit too far into the other side of the water. But nothing more Blue Pikmin can't fix. But instead of fixing it, it actually sparked one of the greatest volleyball matches in history. But we were able to eventually save it by jumping back into the Citadel of Spiders before quickly leaving. And that brings us to our next cave, the Frontier Cavern. So let's hop in. 
Now, this cave is difficult. How difficult, you ask? Well, remember how we left the Bullblack's Kingdom with 18 Pikmin? Yeah, we're doing that again. Exactly. And the reason for this is, well, multiple things, but for starters, let me just show you an attempt at the first sub-level. And something tells me they have treasure. And that doesn't make me happy. Really? So yeah, this is gonna kill a lot of Pikmin. Just to show you what it's gonna do. From this, you might be able to gather why this is going to be horrible. Yep, we get to deal with hazards again, and it doesn't get much better from there. Well, at least we're able to get Boldman a little later on. Or at least we would, if we could whistle them, because, remember, bold men never follow you because they're stuck in a fear state. But, I do have some good news. On sub-level 5, we get access to the Rocket Fist, something that actually increases Olimar's attack power, something that we're going to use heavily later on to kill a bunch of enemies that we don't want to actually risk losing some Pikmin on. So, this actually was a pretty useful cave. But then we got to the Empress Bullblacks. While the first one went down without much of a fight, we're not so lucky on this rematch because of a couple of things. For one, the babies that it uses eat a lot of Pikmin, causing us to have to always be on our toes. And for two, it has a whole lot more health, meaning we can't just overpower it. Instead, we're going to have to be slow and throw only a few Pikmin on it at a time, as basically a sacrifice over and over again. But eventually, I was able to kill it with 18 Pikmin remaining, allowing us to get back the treasure, and allowing us to finish the game. Yep, that's our minimum requirement for paying off debt. But we're not going for paying off debt, we're going for 100%, so it's time to get back in and start exploring some more. Our next stop is the Subterranean Complex, a cave where I actually really started to abuse Olimar's power, and actually began defeating a lot of enemies such as Bullborbs, Armored Cannon Beetle Larva, and even a careening Dereji Bug, something that took way longer than it should have but was possible due to the absolutely normal Olimar hitboxes. But with that, we were able to get down to the final floor before facing off against the Man at Legs. For the fight itself, it really wasn't that challenging because we had Pikmin to spare. So by just spamming Pikmin at the boss, we were able to take it down, but it took 40 Pikmin lives with it. But the important thing is, we did defeat the boss, and we were able to collect everything from this cave. I decided to take down the shower room next, which actually had some difficult parts because of all the enemies that were around, but with enough time and patience, everything went down eventually. The boss on the other hand was a complete joke. That's because you can cheese it by actually separating your captains and switching between them to confuse the AI. So with that, we can leave this cave with everything that we need. From here, the only place to go is the submerged castle. And if you've played the game, you know why I've been avoiding this place. But let's hop right in. Our first sublevel here is Dedicate the Fire, which is a problem because the whole gimmick of this cave is that we're only allowed to bring blue Pikmin in. So we're going to be left with a huge disadvantage, especially since you can normally whistle Pikmin when they're on fire to save them. Here, it's just going to rely on a whole bunch of sacrifice, ending with over 50 Pikmin dead on just the first sublevel. So, with that, I decided to go ahead and leave the cave and come back with a fresh squad of blues. But, you can already see how this cave's going downhill, and I haven't even mentioned the Water Wraith yet. I guess this means I should mention the Water Wraith now. That's because it comes down after 5 minutes and will start rampaging through the castle and there's no way for you to kill it. So, I had a simple goal, that was to get through as quickly as possible to avoid seeing this fun friend. So, I decided to take this advice in one simple word. Run. 
and run I did through the next three sublevels before arriving on sublevel 5. On this sublevel, we actually get to fight the Water Wraith with Purple Pikmin, its only weakness, and we're actually able to take it down. Not before, of course, it kills all but eight of our Pikmin. But eight Pikmin were all that I needed in order to take it down, giving us our reward. The Pluckaphone! A item that actually allows us to call Pikmin directly from the ground instead of having to pluck them individually. Using, of course, the whistle. And because of how important this item is, I wanted to specifically mention it. But with that worthless garbage in our hole, let's go ahead and move to the next cave. Our next cave is actually taking place in the Wistful Wild, the last area of the game. Yep, we've 100 percented everything else, it's time to finish this. So let's start off by hopping right into the Cavern of Chaos. This cave is like the Part 2 version of the Shower Room, with more difficult enemies and more difficult placements, but with enough patience, everything is possible. However, I would like to bring attention to the boss, which is also like the Shower Room where it's easily doable with sprays, and Floor 4. This level features two Emperor Bulblaxes, something that I wasn't really looking forward to. But the developers were kind enough to leave bomb rocks around the arena, and with a little bit of help from those and our blue Pikmin, we're actually able to take down these Bulblaxes without too much incidents. So, everything here was a little difficult, but the Cavern of Chaos is now complete. Now that that's done, it's finally time to enter the Hole of Heroes, easily the most difficult cave in the entire game. That's because, not only does it feature the widest variety of enemies, featuring everything from careening to regibugs to antenna beetles to every type of bull borb, but it also features a wide variety of bosses. So let's go start with them. Our first boss is the Pileating Snaggeret, which we actually have a couple of options for. We can either waste a bunch of sprays to save all of our Pikmin, or we can sacrifice a few Pikmin to save all of our sprays. Now, I ended up getting a run where I only sacrificed 7 Pikmin, so I decided to take that option and save all of our sprays, because we're definitely going to need them for later. While there is a Snagrid in this room, it's not required, so we're just going to skip over that. Instead, we're going to talk about the Raging Bloister because it's actually somewhat of a problem. And it's not actually not because of the Bloister, it's because of these cannon beetles that are around it. We spawn in the middle of the room, which leads us to be a very good target for these beetles. So what I decided to do is take them out first, by taking a singular captain with no Pikmin, and then using the Rocket Fist and the beetle's own boulders in order to take them out. After that, it's as simple as just throwing your Pikmin on to the Bloister to kill it. So, another boss down. Our next boss is the Emperor of Bulblax, but this time we don't have bombs, so we're going to have to kill it the old-fashioned way, which actually ended up working out pretty well as I was able to kill it without losing too many Pikmin. The same can't be said, however, for the next boss, that being the Empress Bullblax. Just like in the Frontier Cavern, we can't actually overpower this one, so we're going to have to play it safe and sacrifice a few Pikmin at a time. This is only made more difficult by the babies running around as well as the rocks that fall whenever the Empress Bullblax crashes into a wall. But at the end, I was able to kill it, but I didn't have that many Pikmin remaining, so it's going to be difficult to take out the next boss. Our next fight is of course against the Man at Legs, which immediately poses some problems because we can't just overpower it like last time. But there is a way to defeat it, and that's by only using one Pikmin at a time. That's because when you only have one Pikmin, you can throw it up onto the boss, it'll do some damage, and once it gets shaken off, you can pick it up before the boss attacks, and then just rinse and repeat. This did take quite a while, to say the least, though. Our next fight is up against the Beagle Longlegs, who actually went down pretty easily, but we did lose some Pikmin in the process. Nevertheless, he did go down, and we were able to collect his treasure and move to the next floor to take down the Raging Longlegs with 46 Pikmin in hand. It turns out that that's easier said than done, for multiple reasons. For one, we can't just overpower it because it has way too much health. I mean, it has an absolute ton of health. We also can't just throw one Pikmin at it at a time, 
because it regens itself so quickly that it'll overpower a singular Pikmin's attacks. Even multiple Pikmin kill it too slowly. Not to mention, when Pikmin get shaken off, they'll immediately start attacking its huge legs, which lead to the problem of them easily getting crushed with no way for us to save them. This boss is truly the perfect monster for this run. It doesn't help that every time that we want to attempt this boss, we have to kill the four jelly floats in the arena, which would normally not be a problem, except for here, we have to worry about a small little quirk that they have. That being, they can create Dazed Pikmin. A Dazed Pikmin is our last Pikmin type, and the best way to describe it is it's essentially a working Pikmin that doesn't work. Now, just like a working Pikmin, the only way to activate it is with the whistle, but unlike a working Pikmin, it doesn't do anything, even if there's a task right next to it. This is a problem because of how boss treasures work. That's because boss treasures don't have a defining weight. Well, they do, like in this case, the remembered old buddy is 30 Pikmin, but they're flexible. If you have less than that amount, the game developers decided to make their weight decrease to your amount of Pikmin. So if you have 18 Pikmin, the weight of a treasure will be 18. This is a problem here, though, because dazed Pikmin are included in this count. And because they won't actually pick up the object, we won't have enough Pikmin to pick up the remembered old buddy. This actually happened on one of the attempts where I beat the boss, where I had dazed Pikmin, so I didn't have enough Pikmin to lift a treasure. This means in order to actually win, we have to defeat the boss with no dazed Pikmin, which is a rare occurrence, or we have to finish with over 30 Pikmin remaining. But I did mention that I beat it once, which means we should be able to develop a strategy to actually beat this. And that's exactly what I did, so let me show you what I came up with. The first thing that I do is I use a spicy spray on my Pikmin. Then I go ahead and throw them all onto the boss. Then, right as the boss is about to shake off my Pikmin, I go ahead and use a bitter spray. Once the bitter spray wears off, my, all my Pikmin fall down. I immediately use another bitter spray though, as the boss has one ever strange quirk that I forgot to mention. That being, the feet aren't active until they crash down. And because they haven't crashed down yet, the Pikmin won't actually attack them and we want to keep it that way for as long as possible. Then what I do is I go ahead and take my Pikmin and throw about half on to the boss, and then spend the rest of the time where the boss is bitter, I'll go ahead and collect the rest of the Pikmin that are on the ground. That way, when the boss gets unbittered again, I'll be able to immediately bitter it, and then throw those Pikmin on, and then rinse and repeat by collecting those Pikmin that are on the ground, and with enough throws, eventually the boss will go down. This did take an absolute ton of attempts, and on my successful attempt I only had one Pikmin to spare. But it was enough. So we were able to beat the Raging Longlegs and finish the whole of Heroes. All we have left is the Dream Den, and while it is definitely difficult, it's nothing compared to what we just went through. With one exception, that being the final boss of the game, the Titan Dweevil. The boss uses four attacks on you at random, and your main goal is to destroy all four. These attacks include the Flare Cannon, Shock Therapist, Monster Pump, and Comedy Bomb. To start off, the Shock Therapist is the least of our worries. It only shoots out a few spikes that cover a very small percentage of the arena. Now, while this electricity is insta-kill, all the elements will kill your Pikmin in this challenge, so that's not really a problem. The Flare Cannon is a more deadly attack, as it'll go ahead and roast all the Pikmin on one side of the arena. But, by going to the other side of the arena, it can be avoided. However, this strat is relatively difficult to pull off, but it can help save some of your Pikmin lives. The Comedy Bomb, on the other hand, covers the entire arena, and will kill all the Pikmin in it, making it a top priority to take down. The last attack is the Monster Pump which actually has a relatively low accuracy, but can hit Pikmin anywhere on the map, even if they're right by the geyser. So it's another top priority, or we need to come here with blues only, which opens up the problem of if we bring blues only, then we can't deal with Comedy Bomb. My solution to this was to start off with the 25 white Pikmin that I had at the time, and take out Comedy Bomb. 
If I could avoid the ever attacks for long enough, we would be able to take out Comedy Bomb and then leave the dungeon and come back with all balloons. And with enough luck, I actually managed to pull this off. After taking down Comedy Bomb, I left the dungeon and re-entered with an army of blue Pikmin, hoping to then take down the other three parts, which I started off by taking down Flare Cannon as it was the biggest threat. Then I followed up by taking down Shock Therapist, which also went down pretty easily. And then the last part was the Monster Pump, which because we brought in only blues, we could take down without any risk. All that was left now was to take down the exposed Twitant Weevil. And after a hundred thousand Pikmin throws, it goes down, giving us the King of Bugs, also known as Louie. After bringing him back to the ship, we can officially say, yes, it is possible to beat Pikmin 2 without the whistle. Thank you all so much for watching, and before I go, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Grass Digger. He originally did a Pikmin 2 A Button Only challenge for this game, and because I used a couple of strategies that were in his video, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to him. So if you enjoy Pikmin 2 content, go ahead and check him out, a link will be in the description below. But with that, I would like to say thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.